We're coming on the air this hour with some breaking news out of Baltimore. This is where the Francis Scott Key Bridge has collapsed after one of its columns was hit by a cargo ship. The Baltimore City Fire Department says it is unsure how many vehicles were on the bridge when this happened, but there was a tractor trailer on it. Take a look at this video. CBS's Jared Hill is here with more on this story. Jared, this video just so dramatic. Well, I mean, this is unbelievable, Chanel. Looking at this video where you see the ship hit one of the mm -hmm. columns and then the bridge just collapse into the water. A major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland has collapsed. This happened just before 1.30 a.m. A cargo ship was seen crashing into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending a huge section barreling into the water. The bridge is more than a mile and a half long, and officials earlier this hour gave us an update. We learned there that two people have so far been rescued. We heard just uh, within the hour that the person who was transported here and treated here following that bridge collapse has been discharged from shock trauma. We've heard from shock trauma officials that there will be a press conference from physicians within the next 20 minutes or so. Now, because of HIPAA, they're not going to be able to provide much information on the patient, who the patient is, and the types of injuries that they had and that they were dealing with. But they are going to discuss how the hospital was prepared for this mass casualty incident and how off-duty shock trauma staff contacted the hospital and offered their assistance, as well as them being a world-class leading integrated trauma facility. I know we talked about a lot of things that made this rescue effort very grim, such as the visibility in the water, the temperature of the water, like we've said, below 50 degrees makes it very difficult to survive. And that's assuming that your head is above the water and that you can breathe during this time. We know these two individuals were rescued pretty shortly after the initial collapse. One of them actually refused medical treatment. I guess they walked away. They weren't seriously injured. The other one was seriously injured and arrived here at shock trauma in serious condition. But it is hopeful that they have been discharged. People miles away reported feeling the ground shake. The explosive impact jolting them from their beds. Well, I was sleeping about 1.30. I felt the vibration of the house vibrating and heard the big bang come down. Looked out on the water. As you can see, you see the ship out there sinking. The bridge is gone. And uh, it was it's unbelievable, unbelievable. I've been in this neighborhood 57 years. I remember when they started building that bridge and can't believe it's gone. I heard a very loud noise. It felt like... I heard like thunder to me, however, it's like very long thunder, but it, it was very loud. I live not too far from here in Dundalk, so I, I thought it was thunder or possibly a train. Crews worked for hours in the dark, cold Patapsco River to rescue those who plunged into the water. Members of a construction crew repairing potholes on the structure. I hope every single one of them is okay. I prayed for them. I'll continue to pray until they're found or okay. Investigators will look at all aspects of the ship and the bridge. This is video from our WJZ crew that passed under the key bridge 11 hours before its collapse. My dad, he takes it in the middle of the night to basically like right in the morning because that's what time he gets off. So I imagine him going over that bridge at like 11 a.m. Like it's got to be crazy. I'm sure you're going to hug your dad yes. when you see him. I am the biggest hug. The port remains closed. Traffic rerouted. Many simply cannot believe the key bridge is gone. You know, we go through a lot. Sometimes Baltimore gets a bad rep, but uh, that's the one amazing thing about our community. We all come together and, and we fight, especially in times of need and tragedy like this one. Nicole Skanga has been following this story for us all day in Maryland. Nicole, great to have you with us. You have some new reporting about what happened on the ship in the minutes before the bridge was hit. What can you tell us? Yeah, I want to outline a few things, uh, Robert. Good to be with you. First and foremost, I just heard from the Baltimore County Executive. He told me that roughly two minutes elapsed between when the pilot and crew first notified Maryland authorities that something was wrong with the cargo container ship Dolly and when that collision occurred at approximately 1.30 a.m. That is how quickly local law enforcement here had to jump into action in order to close down traffic to and from the bridge. We're also learning uh, from local and federal law enforcement officials that the 
tugs on the dolly were loose prior uh, to the collision that occurred, uh, that it is standard operating procedure for the tugs to escort uh, these large container ships out of the port, out of their docking station, but that it is not required for an escort to be there uh, when, when going under the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And so an important note there and also key for law enforcement uh, in the coming days and specifically the NTSB, which has launched its independent investigation of this, is getting on board the ship. They were not able, NTSB, to get on the ship today to get those recorders to determine at what time did the power go off, at what time uh, did the ship's controls really get out of whack here. I was told by law enforcement, uh, by internal briefing papers, that uh, there were alarms that rang out aboard the dolly, uh, that the pilot and crews really had seconds to run a few system checks, and that it was at that moment that the system checks failed, that they reached out and notified Maryland authorities. This morning, Maryland Governor Wes Moore says the ship sent a mayday call after losing power. This enabled officials there to limit some traffic on the bridge before the crash. I recognize that many of us are scared right now. And so I want to be very clear about where everything stands. We are still investigating what happened, but we are quickly gathering details. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Our administration is working closely with leaders from all levels of government and society to respond to this crisis and not but just by addressing the immediate aftermath, but also by building a state that is more resilient and a state that's more safe. And I want to bring in Nicole Skanga for more on this story. She's on the ground near the scene of this collapse at this media checkpoint. Uh, Nicole, you've been there all morning. Hearing about this mayday call that happens uh, before the bridge went down may indicate what led up to this whole incident. Yeah, the city of Baltimore right now in shock and a dramatic retelling from the governor just then about this mayday call. Now, CBS News has obtained an unclassified memo from the Department of Homeland Security that indicates uh, the cargo ship had lost propulsion. It was a motor ship. It had lost propulsion. And the memo goes on to say that the, the vessel notified the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of the vessel and that a collision with the bridge was possible. Just moments ago, I asked the Baltimore mayor, Mayor Scott, about this moment. He said it was critical in order for emergency personnel to get to the scene and for law enforcement to push back any further traffic so that no one else crossed. So this mayday call, he says, saved many lives here in Baltimore. So I want to speak briefly about the terrible incident, an accident that happened in Baltimore this morning. At about 1.30, a container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware to our trainer by car. I've been in Baltimore Harbor many times. And uh, the bridge collapsed, sending several people in the vehicles into the water, into the river. And uh, multiple U.S. Coast Guard units, which are stationed very nearby, thank God, were immediately deployed along with local emergency personnel. And the Coast Guard is leading the response to the port, where representatives from the Federal Highway Administration, the FBI, the Department of Transportation, the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as Maryland officials in Baltimore Police and Fire, are all working together to coordinate an emergency response. Officials at the scene estimate eight people were unaccounted for still, not still, were unaccounted for. That number might change. Two have been rescued, one without injury, one in critical condition. And the search and rescue operation is continuing for all those remaining as we speak. I spoke with Governor Moore this morning, as well as the mayor of Baltimore, the county executive, the United, to both the United States senators and the congressman. And my secretary of transportation is on the scene. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Personnel on board the ship were able to alert the Maryland Department of Transportation that they had lost control of their vessel, as you all know and reported. As a result, local authorities were able to close the bridge to traffic before the bridge was struck, which undoubtedly saved lives. 
Our prayers are with everyone involved in this terrible accident and all the families, especially those waiting for the news of their loved one right now. I know every minute in that circumstance feels like a lifetime. You just don't know. It's just terrible. We're incredibly grateful for the brave rescuers who immediately rushed to the scene and to the people of Baltimore who want to say, we're with you. We're going to stay with you as long as it takes. And like the governor said, you're Maryland tough, you're Baltimore strong, and we're going to get through this together. And I promise we're not leaving. Here's what's happening now. The search and rescue operation is our top priority. Ship traffic in the Port of Baltimore has been suspended until further notice. And we'll need to clear that channel before the sh ship traffic can resume. The Army Corps of Engineers is on the spot and is going to help lead this effort to clear the channel. The Port of Baltimore is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs. And I've been there a number of times as a senator and as a vice president. It handles a record amount of cargo last year. It's also the top port in America for both imports and exports of automobiles and light trucks. Around 850,000 vehicles go through that port every single year. And we're going to get it up and running again as soon as possible. 15,000 jobs depend on that port. And we're going to do everything we can to protect those jobs and help those workers. The bridge is also critical to, for travel, not just for Baltimore, but for the Northeast Corridor. Over 30,000 vehicles cross the Francis Scott Key Bridge on a daily basis. <clears throat> it's virtually, uh, well, it's one of the most important elements for the economy in the Northeast and the quality of life. My transportation secretary is there now. As I told Governor Moore, I've directed my team to move heaven and earth to reopen the port and rebuild the bridge as soon as humanly possible. And we're going to work hand in hand with the support of Maryland to support Maryland and whatever they ask for. We're going to work with our partners in Congress to make sure the state gets the support it needs. It's my intention that the federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. You know, we're not leaving until this job gets done. Not leave until then. So I just want to say God bless everybody who uh, got everyone harmed this morning and their families. And may God bless the first responders, who many of whom risk their lives. March 23rd, 1977, Baltimore welcomed the Key Bridge, spanning across the Patapsco River, completing the eastern sector of I-695. The bridge was a key part of you know, the skyline of our infrastructure, um, it, it knits together the fabric of communities. Connecting Dundalk to Baltimore and Baltimore to the world. Construction on the 1.6 mile bridge started in 1972 to ease congestion throughout the city. Nicholas Redding, CEO and President of Preservation Maryland, says the estimated $110 million project filled a major void in transportation, shipping and infrastructure. They knew that there had to be a second crossing and initially they thought that they would build uh, a tunnel, um, but the, the reality was the tunnel was going to be too expensive uh, and this bridge would not only uh, be cheaper, but would allow them to move a lot of materials um, in a pretty heavily congested area. One of the longest truss bridges in the United States, named after Francis Scott Key, who was inspired to write the Star Spangled Banner after witnessing the bombardment of Fort McKenzie in 1814. Because it's believed that Key was about 100 yards away, give or take, from the bridge itself when he was aboard ship and penned what would become uh, our Star Spangled Banner. Also nestled between Fort Carroll and its 47 years, the iconic bridge has undergone many changes. And perhaps the most notable, its expansion to the lanes leading up to it. There was expansion efforts to make sure that there were four lanes meeting it on either side. Um, so there have been upgrades, expansions done to this uh, facility uh, over the years. Aiding the nearly 31,000 people that MDTA says traveled the bridge each and every day and over 11 million a year. Sometimes we take things like this for granted and then when we lose them, um, you know, we, we really see the impact quite profoundly. The effort to rebuild it uh, is going to be equally historic um, because it's going to be uh, a big effort to not only do that, but to do it quickly, safely.
And we want to take you now to Baltimore, where officials are giving an update on this morning's bridge collapse. As well as Colonel Roland L. Butler, Jr., Superintendent, Maryland State Police. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from a uh, brief statement from each of them on current updates. And after that, we'll be able to take a few questions, uh, but we do need to keep it brief because we want to get these folks back to work. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Shannon Gilry. Hey, good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of the first responders that have come out today to assist in looking for these individuals. We've had tremendous support across the state and county and city and federal enterprise. You've seen for yourself the helicopters flying over, the small boats that are out there, the Coast Guard cutter that's out there, the boats that go back and forth bringing people out on scene to search for these individuals. So thank you to those, this entire community for helping in that regard. Second, I want to say thank you to the community for the outpouring of support to those first responders and in particular the outpouring of support and prayers and support for the families of the six individuals. So I'd like to announce tonight that based on the length of time that we've gone in this search, the extensive search efforts that we've put into it, the water temperature that at this point we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. And so this evening at around uh, 7.30, we are going to suspend the active search and rescue efforts. Coast Guard's not going away. None of our partners are going away. But we're just going to transition to a different phase. And so I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Butler, please. Good evening, and thank you all for being here to echo the Admiral's comments here. We really appreciate the support from the community to all the first responders here. We appreciate your patience and allowing us to do the best job possible and get the information as it comes up. At this point, as the Admiral said, we're going away from the search and rescue portion to a recovery operation. The changing conditions out there have made it dangerous for the first responders, the divers in the water. We will still have surface ships out overnight at 0600 hours tomorrow. We we're hoping to put divers in the water and begin a more detailed search to do our very best to recover those six missing people. Thank you. With that, we have time for just a few questions. We know there's a lot of questions uh, that still have to be answered, and uh, we do have time for just a few. So uh, if we could take a few, please. So do we think it's, it's still just six that there's talk of maybe other cars on the bridge. All, all the information we have is, is six individuals. Got it. Yes, sir. Can, can you go into detail uh, about how difficult this might be for the recovery uh, phase of this now? Like, what kind of challenges are you up against? Well, I'll start by saying I'm going to turn it over to the experts on diving. I'm not an expert on diving, but we've got very difficult water temperatures. You have structures from the bridge that are in the water that can move with the tides and currents, making that dangerous for divers and people in the water to actually try to do recovery. And we do not want to injure any of these first responders in this recovery effort. We, we absolutely want to be as safe as possible for everyone involved in this. And I'll, I'll let, see Colonel Boyle has anything he wants to add. Can you go into specifics Thank about what the search and rescue entailed? Like were there scuba divers or was everything above water, sonar, any sort of equipment that might have been utilized over the past 12 hours? From the outset, we moved all those resources in with dive teams from various state, local, and uh, county agencies. We also use sonar. We're doing our very best in some very difficult times and difficult conditions, which is why we're making that transition now. The last thing we want to do is put divers in the water with changing currents, low temperatures, very poor visibility, visibility, and so much metal and other unknown objects in the water. All it takes is one object to strike an individual and all of a sudden we have a first responder trying to recover another first responder. I think at 0600 we'll find ourselves in a better position to understand the dynamics of what we're dealing with and to address the issue in a much safer manner. Did the authorities have six IDs now and have those victims each been contacted, those families I should say? I can't speak on that. That's still in the investigative portion of this. Can you speak to some of the difficulties in actually retrieving the remains? Have any remains been retrieved? So far, we've also heard reports that there might be individuals 
trapped inside of vehicles, that there might be debris that has made it more challenging for FBI and other law enforcement to deploy? All of that is unknown at this point. And as I said, we have to cease operations. We can't start again until we can assure the safety of those divers and the rescue personnel that are going to participate in this. If we look at how, how challenging it is at a simple motor vehicle crash to extract an individual, I'm sure we can all imagine how much harder it is to do it in climate weather, when it's cold, under the water, with very limited to no visibility. So just to clarify, no remains have been removed thus far by search and rescue teams other than the two who were rescued and alive earlier. That is correct. Okay. So Colonel, you're confident then that no other vehicles made it onto that bridge before the collapse or as it was collapsing, I should say? Based upon the fact the original information that was provided, the Maryland Transportation Authority Police Department was able to shut down traffic. Is there the possibility that there was another vehicle on there other than those vehicles involved in the construction process? I think we all would have to understand, yes, that's a distinct possibility. As unfortunate as it may be, it's a distinct possibility. However, we don't have any information to support that at this point. When you bring the divers out, do you have an idea of where these individuals are, if they were in cars or not, and do you know how long the recovery effort is going to take? We do not know at this point. I'm sure as you've seen some of the aerial photos, there is a tremendous amount of debris in the water from containers hanging off ships. We have to make sure those are shored up. We're going to work with structural engineers to help them understand how to navigate and address the challenges of having bridge structure in the water that may be sharp, that could puncture a suit, that could puncture an airline. All of these are things that we must take our time with. Do you know where the victims are located This last in the question, by the way. I'm sorry? where the victims are located in the water? Have you been able to find them yet or if they're in cars or not? At this point, we do not know where they are, but we intend to give it our best effort to help these families find closure. How might inclement weather tomorrow impact the recovery efforts? Very clearly it could but we're going to do everything in our power to help these families find closure. How stable has the boat been? How stable has the boat been? Miss, how do we get their names, titles, spelling? Is it anybody else? Folks, we're going, to be, we're going to be establishing Unified Command as well as a Joint Information Center. And I know there's a lot of questions, um, and we're going to be providing that information where we will uh, continue to provide updates. Uh, but that is, that is the extent of our updates tonight. We thank you all for coming. Thank you. You've been listening to officials give an update on the major bridge collapse in Baltimore. The Coast Guard says the search and rescue operation is being suspended. It expects the six mi missing workers are likely dead. Linda Tran joins me now. She's a former senior advisor to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. She is currently a partner at Epic Works Advisors, a consulting firm working in the transportation sector. Thanks so much for joining us. We just heard the search and rescue is being suspended. Um, what does the rest of an investigation into an incident, obviously this is an extraordinary incident, but what else might it look like, the investigation into an incident like this? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that there are two parallel but related processes that will be underway. So earlier today, we heard from Chair Jennifer Hammondy and the National Transportation Safety Board, which will be looking into everything from the operations and safety protocols that were uh, taking place all around the cargo vessel itself, as well as taking a look at the technology and any sort of forensic evidence that they can discover. At the same time, the U.S. Department of Transportation, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the Maryland Transportation Authority, you can expect they will, once the recovery effort has ended, they will be taking on additional information. They'll be dredging the waterways there to make sure that operations can get underway as quickly as possible. The responsibilities on the U.S. DOT side of things will be things like supply chain disruptions and making sure that the roadway are open and functioning as quickly and as responsibly as possible, while the NTSB continues to look at the safety implications, any sort of uh, timeline and detailed protocol that uh, will be a result of their discussions and the information that they discover. And Linda, I want to ask you about that supply chain um, disruption. This has forced the Port of Baltimore to close indefinitely, and I just want to run through some of the statistics about the port. It handled $80 billion worth of cargo in 23. The port supports more than 15,000 jobs and is key to shipping things like cars and construction machinery. So two questions, really. How do you think officials with federal money or otherwise going to lessen the effects on the supply chain? 
And do you think there was any case in, or, or any instance in which the federal funds might be used to lessen the blow that this will, will levy on the actual workers at the docks and, uh, and related to commerce through this area? Well, look, John, it, it wasn't very long ago. You've heard the president, you've heard Secretary Pete talk about how we thought Christmas was going to be canceled. That obviously didn't come to pass. I had the good fortune or the bad fortune of being on the front lines of those discussions and the work that was done to make sure that those disruptions did not persist. However, it's important to know that our goods movement chain, the supply chain writ large, is still very fragile. And these kinds of impacts on you know, one of the nation's largest ports, which had, as far as I know, 40 inbound vessels today, 34 of them cargo vessels, that's going to have an impact. And some of the the uh, actions that you saw take place during the major disruptions just a couple of years ago, you can expect are going to come into play here. So you'll see diversions to the ports of Virginia, to New York, New Jersey, et cetera. And then also in terms of the actual traffic flows, there's some additional implications because it's Baltimore. So the trucks that are going to be most impacted, I believe there's something like 4,900 trucks that would come across the Francis Scott Key Bridge every single day. And those that are uh, carrying um, liquids, uh, um, dangerous chemicals, those sorts of things that cannot go into tunnels, mm. they're going to have to do significant diversions, right? Approximately 30 miles in addition to what they would have been able to do on a regular basis if the tragedy hadn't happened with the bridge. So there are going to be some big shifts that um, have, we've seen happen in other circumstances over the last few years, but there's no doubt there's going to be a tremendous impact here. Can you give us a sense of what that would feel like? So 11 million cars uh, drive across <clears throat> the bridge every year. If that is now going to have to be diverted, you already mentioned some of the, you know, you can't just take a new route if you're carrying materials that are hazardous and that can't go on those new roads. So what happens? Does does capacity have to be upgraded in those other routes? Um, do, do, uh, give us, is it possible to give us a sense of what life might look like in other areas that are now going to have to handle all this traffic? So we haven't seen this kind of a tragedy, John, so I'm not going to uh, predict what exactly the local authorities are going to do. What I do know is that this is very interesting in terms of the turf and who's in charge. You've got federal officials involved. You've got state officials involved. You have the city as well as the county. And I know they're all talking to each other about how they're going to adjust their plans, how they're going to prioritize what sort of traffic flow happens and how they're going to address this over the coming weeks. Linda Tran, former senior advisor to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Thanks so much for being with us. We have been out here for hours now, 10 plus hours. And 10 hours ago when we first arrived, hundreds of people were out here trying to get a view for themselves to see what was left of the key bridge. Here we are at close to 8 o'clock and people are still making their way over here, snapping photos, looking at it in disbelief, having trouble coming to grips that this is the reality that this state is now dealing with and the worst nightmare has become a reality after the Coast Guard confirming just a short time ago that search and rescue has now turned to search and recovery for those six construction workers that are still missing tonight. It has been an outpouring of support though coming in from this community and if there's one thing as you both know that Baltimore knows how to do and Maryland knows how to do better than anyone that is coming together during a dire situation and a tragic time and my colleague Jessica Albert she's had a chance to see that firsthand with a visual that was held tonight in Baltimore County and that's where we pick our coverage up with right now. Jessica, good evening. Good evening, Rick. That vigil came together in just a matter of hours. And like you said, it really just speaks to the spirit of Baltimore, of this community, of the entire state of Maryland. People here are going to look out for each other in tough times like these. I will tell you that there were a lot of people at this vigil, including the mayor and the county executive and several other leaders. It was held at Mount Olive Baptist Church. I spoke to the pastor this evening. He says he's hoping prayer and coming together will bring healing to the community and the loved ones of these construction workers who are now presumed dead. At tonight's vigil, community members also said a prayer for the first responders who have been out on that water all day long searching for these construction workers and trying to find answers to, to what played out here in uh, this community. I talked to several other community members who say that the key bridge and, and the, the body of water here in this area means so much to them. It's an iconic fixture and now they're having to grapple with the fact that it is gone and that uh, community members have also presumed to be dead at this point. This vigil, really something special. So many people coming together to lift each other up in prayer. Rick? Uh, Jessica, excellent coverage. 
thank you as we get ready to wrap things up out here. Multiple people still coming by to take a look at this. And it all happened at 1 mm -hmm. 30 this morning, and things uh, quickly played out after that in terms of developments coming through. But still, lots of unanswered questions that we're dealing with tonight. An investigation the NTSB said could take months and months and months to complete. They brought up another bridge accident and collapse that took them two years just to get some of the answers they were looking for. But those six construction workers, that is the big development here as we get into the later hours of the night, now presumed dead. Search and rescue has turned to search and recovery. So please, six men who we know came from overseas, living in the Dundalk and Highland Town community, simply just doing their job at 1.30 in the morning and now presumed dead. Keep their families in their prayers, and as we continue to learn more about them, there will be ways to support them and their families. So please keep that in mind as we move forward here in the coming days.